But in my, two, in my two presentations, the study is going to be entitled, Giving is Biblical. Giving is Biblical. And the sermon title, which I'll give later, is Socialism is Theft, which that should be really interesting because uh, we'll have to define the terms to see whether or not you agree with that phrase or not. But we'll worry about that. And, but part of the reason, part of the rationale, I'm not, there's no secret about it, since I'm not saying positive things about the way I'm defining socialism, I want to make sure that I'm on the record, I'm all for giving. I'm for giving and giving and giving and giving and giving. And so thereby I want it very plain uh, as, I try, as I try to define the terms as I, as I, th best, as I best can, I want you to realize that the, the Bible's very much for giving. So we're going to spend the longer time, the Bible study time, talking about giving is biblical. On the handout, I've got a couple of uh, subdivisions here. I don't have to read all these. I'll read a lot of them. But let's look at the first overall point is about giving to strangers. Giving to strangers. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 19. This presentation, by the way, the Bible study is more a more scripture, and the, pre, the, the sermon time will not be as much uh, scripture. But Leviticus 19, verses 33 and 34, this is a big issue today in this world because of immigration. There's all sorts of immigration factors going on. A lot of the immigration factors are very political. We're not, there are some people who care about immigration from the standpoint of helping poor people. There are some people who care about immigration about helping those in need. But there are a lot of people who are just using the poor people as a symbol to accomplish what they want accomplished. And that, that's, that is very unfortunate because that may not solve the needs of the poor people and actually causes people who are kind to, can get irritated by watching the political maneuverings of, 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 of politicians. But the Bible said, God said in Leviticus 19, verses 33 and 34, If a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not mistreat him. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you'll love him as yourself, for you are, were strangers in the land of Egypt. So he says to not mistreat a stranger. And if, so again, if, when immigrants come into a land, whether they come into the United States or Germany or England or Australia or Italy or Spain or, or Mexico or Honduras, wherever they, immigrants are going, it's best not to mistreat them. And so we're, you know, uh, the Bible would not support people who are down on immigrants to hurt them, to hurt them in any way. Now, Although it does say that we did, this, verse 34 did also say there that uh, they should be as one of you, meaning we should love them and hopefully they would be, become assimilated. But it talks here in Leviticus 24, Leviticus 24, verse 22, talks about not only do you don't hurt them, but it says here in verse 22, you'll have the same law for the stranger and for one from your own country, for I am the Lord your God. So not only should immigrants not be treated badly, but immigrants should not have special treatment. And that is a, it's a very bad decision for a nation, for a government, to give all the immigrants all these freebies. And when immigrants are not paying their taxes, you know, they're, 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 they've worked the system out, they're not paying their taxes, they're getting free hospitalization, and you see, it's something when I see, because like when I go to the hospital, when I went to the hospital two years ago, I had to pay my way. So why am why in the world are we giving freebies to people who are coming here illegally? It's a, it's against the law. I mean, someone could say people can argue about a moral law all they want. But it's technically against the law. And so why are we giving them freebies? And yet I'm having to pay again. So I'm not wanting mine free. I'm just as I'm saying, people need to jump in the system, and be part of the system. The biblical approach was don't mistreat them, but don't treat them specially. Now, I'm not going to turn to Deuteronomy 23, verses 19 and 20, but there was one ordinance where they were to be treated differently. Again, when you look at the Bible, there was one ordinance where the stranger was to be treated differently. Because Deuteronomy 23, verse 19, you were not to charge interest in that system, that, that national system, you are not to charge interest to a poor brother, to a poor citizen. 
But verse 20, you are allowed to charge interest to a stranger, to an immigrant. So someone could say, well, it looks like the immigrant was not treated as fairly as the citizen. That is correct. In that, in that specific instance, the citizen was treated better. So while you at least treat the immigrant on an equal basis, there might even be a few things that would happen where the citizen would get special treatment. So that all this great push to have the, the immigrants given all this freebies is going against the biblical model back in the Old Testament times. And it's, it's really, in my view, is going against common sense. And they may say it's, it's for love or whatever, but it, it is certainly not going to be a wise thing for a nation to do so. But anyway, I wanted to have a few scriptures about giving to the stranger. Now, the rest of the cop, copy I'm going to mention is about giving to the poor, which you'll see often includes the stranger. Th those first things that talk about the stranger only, this talks about the stranger, the poor and the stranger. Let's go to Exodus chapter 23, verses 3 and 6. Exodus 23, these are some general principles of justice. What kind of justice should be given to the poor? What kind of justice should be given to the stranger? Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. You shall not show partiality to a poor man in his dispute. Sometimes people think, well, you know, he's poor. Maybe you should cut him some more slack. You know, if you go into a dispute, if you go into a dispute financially, the, the law, the Bible law was not to say, well, you're a rich man, you can afford it, so we're going we're gonna to give this guy, we're going to give him extra financial benefits because he's poor. He's saying, don't show partiality to the poor. But verse 6 also says, but you shall not pervert the judgment of your poor in the, his dispute. So again, basically saying the same thing. Don't give him special treatment. Don't give him worse treatment. If you're going to have a process of bringing immigrants, aliens, strangers into your land, use wisdom. Let them assimilate them into the citizenry. Let them come in legally. And, and I've, I've made the statement before, it's my opinion, that the legal immigration system in the United States is too tough. I'm only basing that on the people I've talked to. You know, through the years I've talked to someone, I, uh, years ago I was up in, uh, I think it was up in the Branson area, it was, we had, they had a little group in Branson. I was speaking there one day, and the man was there, and the woman, she had just gained her citizenship. And she described all that she had to go through to become a citizen. And it seemed pretty, you know, pretty hard. It seemed very difficult. It seemed pretty oppressive. And so, again, you have the legals have to go through so hard a situation where people are just coming in in flocks because they're being encouraged by politicians because politicians want control and with control comes money. And so, you know, that's, you know, you know all about that. But the, the point is, uh, the Bible's talking about don't show partiality, but don't have injustice. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 117, I'm not going to turn there. Deuteronomy 117 says, injustice, you hear the small as well as the great. So again, you don't want to give, you don't want to help the rich. You don't want to have a wrong justice toward the rich. You don't want to have wrong justice toward the poor. In our effort to be just people, we want to be fair and try to let the, the facts of the case merit what's supposed to be done. You can feel sorry for people, but remember that this justice is supposed to be blind as far as you're not to allow some external things to get in the way. Certainly, you don't let your friendships get in the way. You don't, you don't let your nationality get in the way. You don't let your gender or race get in the way. If you're, if you're trying to exact right justice, you want to do what's truly just. As, as we're here in Exodus 30, 23, verses 10 and 11, this next segment, I have a couple scriptures on the handout that shows how you, you gave excess food to the poor. Again, it was an agricultural system. We're not, we're not very much of an agricultural system today. But in the agricultural system, they left for the poor. The poor, some things were left in the field, which is a great way. If you're going to have a, if this is considered a form of welfare, because our welfare system is out of control, and I, I believe our welfare system is broken, Quite frankly, I don't have any great ideas of how to fix it. I mean, I can, I can talk about things. I can say things are bad or whatever. But to really have practical solutions, I mean, there are some things you can talk about, but none of the solutions would be easy for where we are. It's, it's too bad we wouldn't be approaching it as a joint people working together on this problem to help our, our republic, to help our republic survive and come out of this. 
Unfortunately, right now we've got identity politics and now people are not working together, so thereby the solutions are not very good at all. But one of the things they did in that system, the agricultural system, if you left food in the field, then the poor would go get the food, which meant they would work for the food, as opposed to just sitting at home doing nothing, getting nothing from it all. They would actually get out there doing some work, which would help, which would help their self-worth, would help their, their, you know, all, all the things about themselves. It would just be a whole lot better situation of people earning it a little bit, and meaning that they're putting effort forward to, be, to get something back. And of course, that, that can be done. You know, there, there are some things that can be done. I mean, uh, they, can, they can do drug testing for people on welfare. Of course, that's being fought by certain politicians because there's a big problem. A lot of people who are on welfare are taking drugs. So, I mean, it's, again, like I said, it's a huge problem. It's just, it's, I don't want to talk about all the negative about it today, quite frankly. We, we get that through the week. We want to focus on trying to look at the proper perspective biblically. But Exodus 23, uh, verses 10 and 11. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its product. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. And what, the, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyards and your olive grove. So it's not only being kind to poor people, it's even being kind to the animals. It's really interesting, in my, in my family, uh, I'm a little extreme on this, I suppose. At least my family thinks so. I don't like to throw food away. Now, food that is older, certainly, I don't, we don't want to feed older food to my three-year-old grandson or my, even my 13-year-old granddaughter, or even if my wife doesn't want it. I'll say, no, no, no I'll eat it, I'll eat it. We, we, we were talking about, the, Joyce and I were talking about that. Some things in the, in the refrigerator there. I said, you know, I'll, some of this is questionable, I'll, I'll eat it. But if I don't want to eat it, guess where it goes? I feed the birds. I feed the squirrels. I even feed the coyotes. And I know coyotes are mean and awful, awful animals. But to me, it's like I, I gather up old food, and I want to go out there, and I'll, I'll feed the animal. I, I don't hand feed to the coyotes. <laughs> but I know if I drop a watermelon out in the back area, I know there are going to be some of them getting in there. So to me, it's kind of like you know, I kind of understand, you know, it's, you want to feed poor people for sure, but I'm, I'm even happy to feed the beast of the field, feed the birds, I just love to do that. So the, the principle of, of having excess food to the poor is a good thing. As far as lending, uh, I'm not going to read about lending. Uh, in Exodus Leviticus, it talks about lending to the poor. Back in that system, they, they were, did not charge interest in that system. And that's just letting you know how the biblical approach in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was. I'm not, I'm not making a statement whether or not we should have systems of interest today. Uh, that's not my point. But I'm just letting you know what historically it was. But let's look at some general reminders. General reminders. Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14, verse 21. One of the laws of the time says, you shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien who's within your gates. So what they did in that system, uh, the immigrant, if there was something that died of itself, again, it was still sanitary. I mean, something unsanitary would be discarded, of course. But if something that died of itself that was sanitary, that was to be passed on to the, to the alien, to the stranger. Uh, verses 28 and 29 they had, they had a system in place in the Old Covenant. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates, they may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So part of the use of the tithe at, this, at that time was for the poor. And so, again, be honest, when you see individuals build their empires on tithing today, you watch they have huge buildings, they have huge salaries, they have huge airplanes, and that is so out of line with what the Bible really says. And so, again, then people have devised different types of tithe and different number of tithes, of which are 
are you know, very speculative and, and, probably, and, and I think many of the theories are very improper. But certainly there came a point that the point we see then is you want to take care of your poor. And so part of the tithe was, was used for that. Let's look at, uh, let's go to the next page. Let's go to the book of uh, Psalm, Psalm chapter 112. Psalm 112. This is a beautiful chapter here about the blessing of the righteous. Verse 1, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Verse 3, wealth and riches will be in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. And of course, it is nice when our financial needs are taken care of. Now, our financial needs are not always taken care of. I'm not... If, if you're having financial troubles, this does not mean that you're doing something unrighteous. Sometimes you can be doing everything correctly and still have some financial trial or some financial situation. But we do know that if you're unrighteous, the likelihood is you can have different challenges due to that. But it's not a guarantee. It's not an absolute that you're... In other words, we don't believe in the health and wealth gospel. We don't believe that if, you're, if you do what's right, you will always be wealthy. If you do what's right, you'll always be healthy. We don't believe in that. We, I do believe that there are blessings for obeying God. But I also know that even those who, people who obey God sometimes have challenges because God's looking at the greater good, the greater need. But verse 9, here's the kind of person who trusts in the Lord. He has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. So again, part of the thing of what your life is, you want to be caring about the poor. And so, so we see already we want to care about the poor in a rational way, a reasonable way, a, a wise way. And we were talking in the interactive Bible study. And we do not, we do not dictate how you, how you do your private giving to the poor. So some of us just shared some of our thoughts. And part of what I do, as I tell us, is I'm more like instead of just handing money over to someone at a gas station or somewhere, I will try to give them produce. Now, I do know, see, I'm not... I'm not naive to think that if I buy food for someone, they may use their previous food money to buy alcohol or drugs. I realize they can still, get, they can still win. They can still make it happen. But I want to make them work for it a little bit. I don't want to make it too easy for them. Because many times when people will say, here's what they'll say. I need money. I need food for my children. Can you give me a few dollars so I can get food for my children? And usually what I say at that point is, Let's go to the grocery store. I'll buy food for your children. It does a couple things. First of all, half the time the person says, no, that's okay. So right away that half of people probably didn't want it for their children. They were probably wanting it for their, their drugs or alcohol. But also if they do say, and, and about half the time they'll say, oh, yes, so you'll buy food for my children? I say, I sure will. But then I pick out the food, which meant is, instead of giving them just all chips, you know, I'm, I'm, buying, I'm buying rice, potatoes, things that will last a while. I'm buying things. I'm buying, I'm buying more healthy things for them. This is, this is for your children, supposedly. If it's really for your children, I'm helping them. If it's not for your children, I'm not, gonna let, let, I'm not just going to give you money to burn it any way you want to burn it. So I, tried, I try to disperse to the poor the best way I can. We were talking about that in there, too. There are times, like we have Bruce Graham as a mechanic, and I have another friend, Alan, in Longview, who's a mechanic. And sometimes what I've told people is, I will, I will repair the brakes on your car if one of my mechanics does it. And they'll say, well, I, I have a mechanic I trust. I say, I, I'm sure you do. He's probably a really nice man or woman. But I, want, I will pay for the brakes of your car if you'll use one of my mechanics. And if they say no, that's okay. But that's my offer. I mean, I'm not mad at them. And they can think what they, they can go complain about me. This guy was going to let me, you give me money if I use his mechanic. That doesn't make me look like a bad person. I'm not worried about that. But again, I see, I trust the mechanics. Then they, they'll keep the price down and won't gouge me. And won't, you know, one time I, with Bruce, let's see, there was a car of a, uh, this lady. And I had you ex examine it. You had, needed about $1,000 worth of work. And I said to you, I said, well, you know, uh, we're going to spend about 350 on it. So find the most important things it needs for 350 I mean, Bruce knew it needed more than 350 but he prioritized then 
to help this lady out that we he 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 fixed the three hundred fifty dollars worth. I think he probably did a little extra because he was trying to be kind to her too. But uh, I said that's that's as much as I'm going to spend on this. I'm sure it needed a lot of work. But again, she was ha- oh she was thrilled. Oh she she's still thrilled. She still she talks about it to this day. I, I see her occasionally, and she greatly appreciates it. Now the next two points I want to mention about how we give. And I want you to notice they both work and they're both good. The, f- the first one I'm going to mention is the Bible teaches private giving. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The Bible teaches private giving. By that I mean you can do it yourself. You, and you do, the, you, you do this yourself. You give to people based on what you see and need. Well, you know what it says here in, pri- in Matthew 6, verses 1 through 4. Take heed that you do not your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before as the hypocrites do in the synagogues or in the streets, that they can have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in the secret, and your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And this is done by you many times. Now, that doesn't mean people can't find out. It's not, in fact, sometimes if, if you're, it's, sometimes it's good to talk about it. Let, let's, say, let's say there's a certain widow who has something needs to be done on her house. It, it might actually be in the best interest if, if some of the people who want to work on the house talk about it to kind of coordinate a little bit or to say, oh, by the way, I, I did such and such for that person or I did such and such for this person. It's not saying you can't do it. What it's saying is don't do it to be impressive. Hey, did you see what I did? Look at what I'm doing. That's, what he's, that's the whole point here. The whole point is don't be advertising what you do for glory's sake. Don't be advertising what you do to be people patting you on the back sake. But certainly people do a lot of giving. In fact, there's, there's so much giving that, you, I mean, every time you give, you don't talk to me about it, nor should you. In fact, I don't even think you talk to God every time you do something nice, although you're probably closer to doing that. You may get down, you may actually get on your knees later and say, you know, it felt so good to give that money for that person's gas, and uh, thank you for helping me see it. And So God sees everything anyway, but you may talk to him about it. But most of your giving is private. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. Again, this is where we have to be really careful. When I, I talk about the Bible, and there's a couple parables we can look at maybe in the next ser- in the sermon. You don't want you don't want you want to be careful how you read a parable. Sometimes people make doctrine out of a parable. In other words, there's a parable over in uh, Matthew 20 that people use to support uh, the concept of socialism as they describe socialism. But then some people use the, a parable in Matthew 25 to support the view of capitalism. And, you know, the, the point is, I don't, I don't think, I would not personally want to use either parable against itself like a wrestling match. I, I don't think that's what we want to do. We want to learn the lesson of each parable. And I don't think, I don't think each, either parable is not really hammering socialism or capitalism. There's another thing about the parable we want to learn from. Now, I bring that up here because here's where... If you take this scripture literally as a message to you, you're probably not doing it. Okay? If you take this verse literally as a message to you, you're probably not doing it. This is Matthew 19. This is where I will start verse 16. Behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing must I do, shall I do, that I may inherit eternal life? Jesus said, Red letter. Why do you call me good? There's no one's good but one, and that's God. If you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And the man said, which commandments? And he mentioned some of the Ten Commandments. He didn't mention all ten of the commandments. He mentioned mentioned them, but he also talked about uh, the first ones. He he talked about, again, talking about loving your neighbor as yourself. He was talking about the two great commandments. I don't think he's only talking about the second great commandment only, but he's talking about the great commandment. But there's, you know the story, verse 20. The young man said to him, All these things I've kept from my youth, what do I lack? 
Someone would say, oh, I, I believe in the commandments. I try really hard to keep the commandments. And Jesus said, now, you're going to take this one of two ways. You're going to take this as a specific diagnosis of that man's problem, of which that man had to change. Or you're going to take this as a universal situation that all of us need to do, and you need to do it too. And if you're taking it as a universal situation, you're probably not doing it. Now, someone will say, Dave, you're not doing it. That's right, because I don't take this as a universal exhortation. I don't think God's telling me this is what I have to do. I'm saying God told this man that this is what he had to do. Now, again, I point this out because the atheists who look at their Bible and they look for little literal words and English words, they will say, you Christians are a bunch of hypocrites because you don't follow Matthew 19, 21. And, of course, I say, no, I don't follow it explicitly. They say, why? Because I don't think it was explicitly said to me. Now, if God says to all of us this was explicitly to all of us, then we're all failing in this. But rest assured, I don't think this is explicit to all of us. I think the principle's true. I think we should be living by the principle, but not explicitly by the details that he said to that man. Because what he said is, If you want to be perfect, go and sell what you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Okay, if you take it literally, then you have to sell your cars. Can we, are you allowed to keep one? Can you have a motorcycle? Okay, can, can we keep at least one car? Uh, do we have to sell our home? We can no longer own a home. We live in a tent. Now again, if that was explicit to every Christian, look at, look at how much we're failing. If I, t I personally take it as an instruction to that man, because that man was like, I'm keeping the Ten Commandments. And he's saying, well, yeah, that's good. Keeping the Ten Commandments is good. However, you know, you got this deeper, this more than the Ten Commandments. By the way, I think what all of us should do, as we love the Ten Commandments, I think all of us should look at what specific things should we be working better at. What would God explicitly say to you? What would he say to you is, here's something you really need to do. You're keeping the Ten Commandments is good, but just like that man had a problem giving to the poor, you have a problem with this, and so thereby I'm giving this explicit instruction to you. Of course, we don't always know what that is, but it's healthy to think about that. But again, giving to the poor is something private, something done giving. The Matthew 25, I'm not going to turn there. You know Matthew 25 about... Well, let's turn to Matthew 25, even though we all know it. Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40. Here again, this is personal what you're doing, personal giving. And the king said to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you, you, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to see me. And then the righteous will say, when did we see you do all this? In verse 40, he said, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. I, I know there's a verse over in Corinthians, excuse me, in Galatians that says to take care of the household of faith first. I know that verse is there, but it's not just limited to the household of faith. Because when you have a chance to help somebody, you have a chance to help Christ. That's what he's saying. He's saying, picture it that way. He said, when you help them, you're helping me. And of course, we would say, well, you don't need anything, son of God. You don't need anything, Savior. Because I know I don't need anything. But how you looked and how you helped other people was very critical. So the Bible is very much forgiving. It's very much a part of this. Now, Luke 3, verse 11 talks about uh, if you have two coats and someone doesn't have one, give it to him. So again, there's times, again, again, one of the differences we're going to talk about socialism and, and, and also giving is the way we're going to define socialism in the second sermon is something that's required by force, required by force and penalty. And see, this, the, the instruction to give a coat to someone is not, you know, you're, not, you're, going to, you're not going to suffer a penalty for that. In other words, see, uh, civil governments 
if, if any nation through a dictatorship or through voting, through a republic voting, if, if they take on socialism, that is now forced upon people by the law of the land. And it means it's, it's, in, it's backed up by the government. It's backed up by law enforcement. It's backed up by regulation. In other words, uh, taxes. In my mind, taxes are a form of theft. But on the other hand, it's, it's the law of the land. And so if someone came to Jesus and said, are you going to pay the, the theft of taxes? And Jesus said, yep, we're going to pay it. I'm going, to, I know, I'm going to recognize it for what it is. I'm, I'm, I, in fact, in some places you can live in states that have less taxes. You can, you can live, you know, like if Big Sandy schools want to raise the taxes for their artificial field, the football field, well, they, they can do that. I guess my choice, is, my choice is either pay the tax or move out of the, this district. I have a choice yet, but... Uh, I like I like living in a state like Texas. See, I'm a big fan of I'd rather sales tax over income tax. I, I don't like a government paying me a tax on my income, but I don't I have less problem with a government paying having me paying a tax on what I spend. The reason I like that is see I like the fact that we have Texas has no state income tax, but it has a higher sales tax, which is great because. I know people who buy boats and cars and, and fancy stuff. They're going to pay more tax on, based on, on their actions. They're going to base more money on what they choose. So if I choose to live in a smaller house, and if I choose to live in, have older cars, and if I choose to buy less fancy things, and if I choose to buy less toys, then I'm paying less tax. So to me... A income tax should be low or non-existent in the state, which I'm so happy about. But I think if a sales tax is up higher, to me it's like those who spend the money pay the freight. And I think that's more fair. I'm not paying the freight for their spending. I'm not paying for their, their lust of toys. They, they can say, well, you just don't need to have a lot of toys. That's right. I don't have a lot of toys. And so I'm very happy not paying for someone else who has toys. Doesn't that make sense? But see, what happens when government gets involved, there's penalty and force. They then say, here's what, if you don't do this, here's the penalty. We were saying in there, church government, what church government does, it, now back years ago, church government burned people at the stake. Years and years and years ago. Now today, the worst thing most churches can do is just slander you. They can shun you. They can, they can talk your family to not be around you. They can talk your friends not to be around you. And then while that may sting a little bit, that's not the same as government regulations being forced by whether it be civil government or church government. Anyway, then we come to the, the last part, the, my last few minutes. I talked about the Bible teaches private giving, but the Bible also describes group giving. Let's go to Genesis, I mean, excuse me, Acts chapter 2, verse 44. Acts 2, verse 44. The Bible talks about group giving. And there's times when the brethren uh, from Spain gave uh, money to the people in Judea. Uh, people in, in Antioch gave it to Judea. In other words, the brethren took up an offering. They took up a free will giving. See, that wasn't... that. Free will giving is not legislated by a leader. It's not forced upon someone. You will do this or else. Now, what happened is, see, some people, and I'm going to mention this here quickly, in Acts 2, verses 44 and 45, many, uh, basically, most churches do not think this is socialism. Most churches. However, many historians and many atheists and many agnostics like to say the early church practiced socialism. And the, you, the big difference was, the big difference was, this giving, this sharing was not commanded by the government. And I don't even think it was commanded by the apostles. Verse 44 and 45. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. But if you, if you were to check the internet, most religious, most churches do, do not think this is socialism or communism. I'm sure you'll find some people, I know you'll find some people who think that. 
But most people do not. Most Bible students, most historians do not consider that. But again, the, the, the difference is this was not forced upon them. They sold their possessions and their goods. They divided among themselves as everyone had need. Brethren, the difference is this. If some of you want to do this voluntarily, that's your business. You know, if, if the West and the MacGyvers want to pool their resources together, that is their business. If they want to put their cars in both their families' names, if they want to move into one house together, that is their business. If they want to give up ownership of their homes and live in a tent together, that is their business. And I can pick any of your names. If Ruth Rowe and Colette Atterbury, Colleen Atterbury, if they, want to, if they want to get together and pool resources and give up ownership and want to do that, that is their business. I'm not recommending that, by the way. I'm not recommending that. I'm just saying you have the freedom to do that. And the big, the big key is freedom and choice without penalty, without punishment. And to me, that, that's why it, it can be very simple in describing it. It gets over in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. See, in, that, in, that, in socialism, people give up their possessions. They don't own things. It becomes part of the group, would be part of the community, whether the community is small or whether. But if you want to do that, if you want to give up ownership of what you have and go to work with either family members or friends, I don't recommend that. I do not recommend it. I'm just saying you have the freedom to do that. Quite frankly, if you try to do that, it'll, it'll probably blow up on you. I know some church people who moved over to South uh, Utah. And they tried to live together. And, of course, it turned out very badly. But I could talk about that in the second sermon. But here it goes, verse 34. Nor is there anyone among them who lacked for anything. For all the possessions of lands and houses, they sold them and put them together. Now, I, mentioned, I did mention in the, in the interactive Bible study, uh, some, some dealing with people's futures uh, is having a trust as people get older, it's good to put things into a trust. It's better when the person dies for how, do, how you can manage the, their assets and also can protect your assets. But that, that's different. That's not what he's talking about even here. The principle is that, though, they did not own things. And in a trust, the, the people don't own the things the trust does. But a trust is done actually to protect and preserve and, and organize. It's not done to gain or to steal from anybody. Anyway, back then, they were so excited about the way of God, they chose to work together and share things together. And you're free to do that. But again, I would recommend you be very careful about doing that. I would not recommend you do that. But anyway, I, I spend a little time here talking about giving. There's all so much that we could talk about, and there's much, many of the scriptures on the handout I never got to. But again, if you look at those scriptures, you look in the Bible, take a concordance, look in the Bible about giving. And I want you to realize, giving is very biblical. Now, if you'll bow your head, we'll ask God's dismissal. Our loving Father in heaven, Father, we thank you so much to talk about your way of life. You're such a giving God, and we'd like to learn about your giving. We like, we like the freedom to give. We'd like to give with an open heart. We'd like to give with a, a free heart, a loving heart, cheerful heart. And, Father, we'd like, we'd like to serve you in that way because that's the way you serve us. That's the way you help us. So, Father, we ask your blessing on the sermon. We thank you for the material here. Let it be of value to us. We ask your blessing on the service coming up that we can understand more about how you've given us instructions and how we can live profitably in this day and teach others to live the same way. We ask your dismissal and give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.